22nd of November 2021. A national anti-corruption body. You've got to have processes that assume people are innocent. A, a federal anti-corruption body. From news.com.au. I'm Andrew Buckalo, and I've got news for you. You've probably heard about the push for a federal ICAC lately. Now, if you're not quite sure what everyone's on about, an ICAC is basically an anti-corruption watchdog that investigates public servants who have potentially done the wrong thing. Naughty people. Now, each Australian state has their own ICAC to catch out corrupt politicians, but there isn't a federal one to keep our pollies in Canberra in line. And that's got a lot of people outraged. It is absolutely crazy that every state and territory has one, but our federal government does not, and we need to fix it. Today, we'll find out why Scott Morrison's government has dragged its feet on setting up a federal ICAC. We'll take a look at what the government has suggested and we'll chat to an ICAC insider from New South Wales who reveal all the sneaky tricks they use to expose dodgy politicians. Each Australian state and territory has their own anti-corruption watchdog. Victoria's is known as IBAC and the one in New South Wales is known as ICAC. They exist to try and prevent breaches of public trust and guide the conduct of public officials. And if anyone in the public sector is suspected of being corrupt, it's their job to investigate. Here's news.com.au's national political editor, Samantha Maiden. They act as sort of more of an investigative arm, right? And usually what happens is they can make adverse findings against people, but then it's up to them to refer a brief of evidence to the DPP. Over the years, these anti-corruption bodies have claimed some pretty big scalps, including former New South Wales Premier Barry O'Farrell, who resigned after he was found to have accepted a $3,000 bottle of wine without declaring it. And then, of course, there was New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian, who resigned recently after the ICAC said it would investigate whether she'd breached the public's trust during the course of her secret relationship with a former parliamentary colleague. I cannot predict how long it will take the ICAC to complete this investigation, let alone deliver a report in circumstances where I was first called to give evidence at a public hearing nearly 12 months ago. Therefore, it pains me to announce that I have no option but to resign from the office of Premier. These state anti-corruption watchdogs monitor the behaviour of state-based politicians. But so far, there isn't a federal anti-corruption body to keep federal politicians in check. So why isn't there? Well, I suppose there's two ways you could look at that, right? One, you could say, oh, do we need a federal one? Can't they do it at the state level? Um, But it, it does seem to be the case that, for example, in New South Wales, it is an offence for a New South Wales politician if they hear anything that is of concern or anything that is suspicious not to report that to ICAC, and that's right. There's no similar legislation at a federal level. Like There's nothing that says if you're a federal MP and you don't refer something to ICAC that you get into trouble. There's arguments from both sides, right, because there's always a concern. In theory, these things sound great, right, like dodgy people should be you know, looked at. But in practice... You know, clearly these things can be weaponised and you already have this situation where every time, you know, something happens, you always have both sides of political politics go, we're referring it to the AFP, right? Like, mm-hmm. police are investigating. And it's become a bit of a joke, right? Because what happens nine times out of ten is two months later the AFP report back and say, nothing to see here. Like, it seems like a giant waste of money. So, obviously, if this sort of thing existed, there would be legitimate things that it could look into, No doubt the raft of allegations that have emerged in recent years that people have said why we need an ICAC, you know, when they flogged um, parcels of land for much cheaper than they should have and, you know, a whole range of allegations. But there's also a danger that in codifying these things that you basically weaponise them. And, And I think the big debate around a federal ICAC has been around the model. Is it like New South Wales where you sort of have these public hearings the federal government seems to want to avoid that, so they want it to be this sort of giant secret thing. But then the argument goes, well, that's like a star chamber, right? Like mm. you need to have public hearings. And I think sometimes the public hearings were, in terms of the ICAC are not entirely understood because by the time they get to that point, they've actually done a lot of investigations. They've generally brought people in for private interrogations, <laughs> what of a better word. And so, you, you know, like if they have a public hearing, they're basically saying, well, we think there's something fairly significant here. 
you know, we've already interviewed, they've already brought Gladys in uh, to have a chat to her and they've got all that on transcript, but they're basically deciding that it is part of the deterrence for corruption that politicians know that, you know, they might be called before this body and it could be very embarrassing. And so the threat of that happening, even though politicians really worry about that because they think we could have these careers unfairly derailed, which is a significant and reasonable concern, there's also a deterrent effect in that, that people think, oh, well, if you might be hauled before ICAC, you're going to be a bit more careful about doing something potentially dodgy than you might be if it was all held behind closed doors. During the 2019 federal election, the coalition, led by Prime Minister Scott Morrison, promised it would set up a federal ICAC. But with another federal election less than six months away, so far they haven't delivered. Mr Morrison's government has floated the idea of establishing a body called the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, but critics such as Geoffrey Watson SC claim it's, well, a piece of shit. Some people would say it's better to have something than nothing. This is worse than nothing. It would actually operate, I believe, to set back corruption exposure. It, in fact, may even encourage it. Helen Haynes is the independent federal member for Indy in Victoria and she is definitely not a fan of the government's proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission. I'm not a fan of it, Andrew, because uh, it's not designed to achieve uh, the purposes that it needs to achieve. So we've got a problem that needs to be solved and that's around ensuring that we have transparency and accountability in the federal parliament, that we can be absolutely certain that MPs, that ministers, that departmental officials are undertaking their duties in a way that ensures there's complete accountability to the use of taxpayer funds, uh, that any suspicion of corruption can be dealt with. And uh, the government's proposed bill, and that's all it is, we actually haven't seen any legislation, has uh, a couple of problems with it. And fundamentally, one problem with it is that it would only investigate issues that could be criminal. And um, that means broader issues of corruption would never even be referred to the Commission. So that's a real problem. Right now we can deal with criminal issues. We've got courts to do that. So an integrity commission is not about replicating the courts. It's about having a process to make sure that uh, we can investigate broader issues of alleged corruption. So you proposed a different model for a federal ICAC. Uh, It would be called the Australian Federal Integrity Commission. How does yours differ to the one put forward by the government? Yeah, in lots of ways, actually, Andrew. So fundamentally, it wouldn't be replicating the court system to start with. So referrals could be made to this commission, this independent commission, and it's fundamental that your listeners understand that. This is a commission that's separate to the parliament. It has oversight in lots of ways from the parliament, but fundamentally anyone can make a referral and that there are whistleblower protections for people who may make a referral. That's really important because it's sometimes junior people in government departments who see when things are not going right. Uh, Under the government's model, they could never make a referral. You don't need to approve that there's an alleged criminal act going on to refer. So those broader issues of things like uh, pork barrelling, alleged maladministration of taxpayer dollars for electoral purposes or conflicts of interest could be referred. Under the government's model, they can't be. Under my model, there's the capacity for public hearings and public reports. Now, that's really important because we need to shine a light on alleged corruption. We can't have any investigation going on behind closed doors and and secret reports. Otherwise, the public doesn't have clear sight on what's going on. So really important that there are public hearings. The government model doesn't allow for public hearings for MPs or senior departmental staff. So they do for the Australian Federal Police and other government officials, but not for MPs. And um, I don't think that really passes the pub test when it comes to the general public. Mine has many safeguards built in because one of the key complaints from MPs mainly is that integrity commissions or anti-corruption commissions can be used uh, really as a star chamber, can be used to destroy politicians' lives Mm. and that's not the intent of this. So there needs to be safeguards built in there to make sure that before anyone came before a public inquiry that there's been really careful 
consideration by the commissioner to make sure that there really is something to be investigated. And, and likewise, a person, you know, maybe a staffer of an MP who by virtue of association could have their career ruined. That needs to be made really clear and there's the opportunity for a private hearing in those kind of situations. So there needs to be safeguards there. And how is your bill going? Does it have widespread support from other federal MPs? It has widespread support across the nation, actually. (laughs) Many, many retired judges, legal experts and academics have worked with me on this bill and have given this particular legislation that I've drafted a gold star in terms of its broad-based powers, its fairness, its fitness for purpose. And there's an organisation called the Centre for Public Integrity, which its whole mission statement is about making sure we have the highest levels of integrity in government, have done a study on all of the integrity commissions in every state and territory and looked at the government's legislation and my proposed legislation and have said this is the bill that is the most fit for purpose and would do the job we want it to do. So, yeah, it's got a lot of support within the parliament, all of the crossbench members in the House of Representatives and the Labor Party support my bill and I've been working closely with government members on the coalition side side and um, they've made some really good improvements in that drafting as well and uh, I would hope that should the opportunity come that perhaps some of those people may be willing to vote to have my bill uh, debated and then uh, and then passed. So what's stopping it from being debated and passed? Is it the Prime Minister who's stopping it? Well actually even before we get to that Senator Rex Patrick, you may may know, Senator Patrick from South Australia, he has introduced my bill into the Senate. So it's actually now sitting on the notice paper in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. So the government could, if they chose to, debate it in either house. Now, what's stopping it right now? It's the government stopping it. And of course, the government is led by the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister wished this to proceed, he could just give the signal. So why is it that you think he wants perhaps a weaker option in the form of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission instead of yours? Is he afraid of yours? I think that the government are afraid of mine. Yes, I do. I think it is a much more powerful bill. It's a bill that's actually learnt the lessons from all of the states and territory commissions it actually would do the job it's designed to do. I think that it's a real shame that the government are shy of doing what needs to be done here. Again, I want the Australian public to get what they need to ensure that they can have the trust in their federal government that they deserve. And the only way we're really going to achieve that is to finally establish an integrity commission. It is absolutely crazy that every state and territory has one, that our federal government does not, and we need to fix it. Jeffrey Watson is an ICAC insider who spent years assisting in several public inquiries investigating allegations of corruption amongst New South Wales politicians. He believes a federal ICAC should be modelled on the one in New South Wales and revealed to I've Got News For You exactly what tricks the watchdog uses to investigate corrupt pollies. So what's the process when someone suspects that there is corruption? How does an investigation begin? There's a complaint procedure, you simply phone in or write in a complaint. Then there's a group that sift through those because a lot of them you would know would be just rubbish, you know, quite mad. But then some of them are thought, well, this is worthy of further attention. There's a second sifting, a third sifting, and then it goes through all sorts of processes. Can I tell you an amusing side story to that? The inquiry which led to the discovery that the Obede family were organising the coal mine over their property That came through an anonymous tip-off made from a public phone box. So once an investigation is launched, what powers do ICAC have to try and dig up evidence? Well, ample powers. It's powers far in excess of, for example, the police. At the most basic level, you've got a team down at ICAC which consists of people such as skilled investigators, usually former coppers, then skilled forensic accountants, people who pull the books apart, then what they do is they utilise powers to collect documents and other records so that they can go directly to a person's bank and say, show us these records. Or they can go to other agencies such as the corporate agencies and the like and try and find out where money is going and who's actually getting it. And in terms of powers, can they do phone taps and surveillance and stuff like that? 
yes, subject to certain limits. For example, because phone taps is a federal matter, they have to go and get permission from a delegated authority, usually through the AAT. If it's a state matter such as entering premises and seizing documents, then that's done through other angles, usually through the magistracy. But the thing is that there is, contrary to some of the howling right-wingers who oppose an ICAG, very strict oversight at each step of the way as to what is done. Do you wish that ICAC had even more powers than they currently have? I think New South Wales is properly empowered. My experience, direct experience in New South Wales was, I wish it was getting a little bit better funding because there were times when there were compromises made on what could be taken to a public inquiry and what couldn't, simply on the basis of money. Sometimes you've got an investigative team looking at a really interesting issue, but you see a spin-off and decisions have to be made as to whether the resources are available to investigate the spin-off. Often they're not. And I can tell you, I've been involved in some very frustrating moments where it was decided we just did not have the money or the facilities to go after a, a promising angle. So that means that there's corruption going on that will never get exposed or, or people punished for? I'm afraid that's true. You have to pick and choose your targets. So you go for the more serious targets, obviously. You only go for serious targets. But amongst those, you look at what is the most telling area. There's a push for a federal ICAC. Now, the coalition has put forward something called the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. What's your opinion on that? It's rubbish. In fact, I go to Canberra a bit to talk to people, uh, One of the other guests, Helen Haynes, is one of the people who's had to suffer uh, listening to me. But the thing is that if the federal parliament puts up, as I think they might, uh, put up this bill before Christmas or at least before the new election, I'll be going to Canberra to talk to politicians to get them to reject it. Some people would say it's better to have something than nothing. This is worse than nothing. It would actually operate, I believe, to set back corruption exposure It, in fact, may even encourage it. I'm happy to go into the detail of that if you're interested. Absolutely. Tell me how come. Well, the fact is that once a complaint is referred to this CIC, it has to remain a deadly secret. And it remains a deadly secret right throughout and even after a report is made by the CIC, it can only become public in the event that the DPP, the Commonwealth DPP, indicts an individual. Now, the thing is that there's a huge gap between public sector corruption and being able to frame something as an indictment to bring it to a court. So in other words, there could be politicians, senior bureaucrats who are acting corruptly. We will never find out about it because they could even refer their own conduct, by the way, off to the CIC, and then it must remain a secret. There are other angles about it which are just appalling. For example, I point out that the only people able to make a referral to the CIC are either a very senior bureaucrat or the relevant minister. That means that nobody can gob in their boss. And the thing is that you can imagine even heads of department would not make a referral without having taken the matter first to their minister. In other words, it's a sham, it's a farce, it's worse than nothing. And I'm really actually appalled to think that it'd be brought in, even suggested. It's very poorly thought through. We'll keep you up to date on the push for a federal ICAC on news.com.au. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for listening and I'll chat to you again next week.